mate, I'm in the shit next week because if my missus finds out and she reckons I can do this with the kids, I don't know how you've, I don't know, I don't know how you've done it, mate. The week man's been brilliant. Welcome back to Rugby Pass Offload with me, Mark Edwards, joined as always by the irrepressible comedy duo that is Glasgow Warriors captain Scotland international Ryan Wilson and Bristol Bears prop Max Lay. For delighted to be also joined on the show by San Diego Legion and former Queens and England legend Chris Robshaw. How are we all doing, guys? How are you doing, Chris? Yeah, good. Nice to see you all. Um, yeah, I'm just saying I'm back in London at the moment. So, it's, yeah, good to be home and catch up with some friends and family. Lovely, man. Not quite San Diego. What's San Diego like? Is it nice? Yeah, it's pretty beautiful, to be honest. Um, it's a little bit different to back here. I mean, last year, last year there was a, a lot of kind of to and fro, and we actually moved to Las Vegas for two months. Oh. Um, and we're living in Las Vegas, but... Uh, I'll tell you, when you're not on a strip in Las Vegas, it's not quite as glamorous as it fully appears. Um, but yeah, due to COVID reasons, we moved there, then we moved back to San Diego. But yeah, look, San Diego is beautiful. We live kind of five minutes from the beach. Uh, a lot of our recovery sessions and extra fitness is down on the beach. Um, and it's just a, it's a lovely climate, lovely place to be. Did you have to take the family to Las Vegas or were you able to go there on your own? No, nah, we all went. Yeah, we all went. Uh, as... As we kind of got there, my wife was heavily pregnant. We had our baby over there. And she was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to have my baby in Las Vegas. <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily, we got back to San Diego. So that was, uh, yeah, that was a little bit calmer and a bit more kind of, a um, bit more of a hippie vibe. I just like, I just picture, um, what's that, Breaking Bad? Like, you know, the house from no. Breaking Bad? Nothingness with these small houses in the middle of nowhere. Is that what, the burb, is that yeah. what it's like, yeah. that outside of the strip? Yeah, a little bit, because we actually had to drive there, because we went to San Diego, we were based there for a couple of weeks, and we basically all packed up and drove to Vegas, which, again, you drive through absolutely nothing. It's, it's one of those things which I recommend doing. I wouldn't do it again, Yeah. but once you see it and see the buildings, and like you said, just these towns just appear, and then nothing, and then the town appears, and then there's nothing. Um, but look, there was, there's a lot going on there, more than just a strip. Um, but yeah, like a lot of people were saying, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back unless you're going to party and all that kind of stuff. So, so we made the most of it. And I think one of the things of actually being there was when we actually went there when it was quite a severe lockdown here. Whereas over there, the Americans are, are slightly different around their lockdowns and stuff like that. Yeah. So people could we go out for restaurants, we go out to have some beers, all that kind of stuff. It was a, yeah, a little bit different. The beach was a massive kind of relaxation period for me and kind of a, a mental tool for me, but especially when I was playing at kind of the top level and stuff, just going in the water, going in the ocean, it was, it was so like recharging. Um, and to have that kind of five minutes at the end of most days, a couple of times a week, you're down in the sea, you're on the beach, you just sit there for a couple of hours. It's, it's lovely. And that, that was very peaceful. Uh, the food's pretty amazing as well. Uh, the food's pretty good. Uh, the worst thing, you know, the worst thing actually, I miss walking. I miss walking around and I've lived in London kind of my whole life and you kind of, you jump on a tube, you walk to the corner shop, you then walk to see a mate somewhere else in the park. Over there, everything's so spread out, you, you have to drive everywhere. Um, and it's a weird thing and I didn't actually realise I missed it until I got back. Um, and yeah, now back in London, you literally just walk everywhere. Um, so yeah, it was a strange thing, but yeah, probably that. When they come over here, they come to a little English village. Oh my God, look at this English village. <laughs> so beautiful. Like a little pub, you know, down the road. You can't just walk down to the local pub, can you? Get in the car no. and you've got to go somewhere. And it, yeah, it is like that. I think like it's more of the cities, because we were in like this beach town place. Uh, I think like obviously New York and Chicago and those type of places, you can walk a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but look, it's so spread out. There's so much land. And that's the thing I didn't realise about playing there, how big the country was. And it before I went, someone said it's like playing between Ireland and Istanbul. You're playing for that many territories, that many different terrains, all that kind of stuff. And we played Atlanta um, in Atlanta, which was, it was about a five hour flight. And then we played them at 12 o'clock their time, which for us back in San Diego is 9 a.m. in the morning. So, you, you, and you're only going the day or two days before. So you imagine yeah, yeah, just getting yeah. up and going to play a proper game. It was quite a, yeah, surreal experience. Yeah, it's all good though. Eh? Different experiences. That's why I think it's attracting a lot of boys. There's so many different things over there. Like for for rugby, they, I mean, all the stuff I've heard from a lot of the guys, especially because I mean they had it pretty easy at LA, LA Guiltinis. They've been absolutely loving it. They won the league. <laughs> like 
honestly, is as close to any sort of Americanized sport you can get. Those boys out there smashing the social media. Um, they didn't. They don't have broccoli, man. That's for sure. That's the one thing they're missing. Did you come across broccoli, man? No, I've no idea what that is. <laughs> mate, <laughs> mate, look him Sounds up. Sounds like He's, the worst mascot in the world. <laughs> he basically is. He's a bloke that sits and eats raw broccoli in the crowd. Is he dressed as a broccoli? I don't think he is. No, he's just he's just got a t-shirt saying I love broccoli. Yeah, all those little experiences. I suppose that's what's pulling people over there, isn't it? Yeah, and look for me, it was it was about that. I spent my whole career at one club, um, my whole life in kind of that area of London. I just wanted something different, which wasn't going to be kind of a 10, 11 month season with pre-season, all that kind of stuff. Mentally, I just needed a different challenge. And it's definitely done that. I go back again in January for one more season. Uh, we'll see how the body is kind of coming into that. Um, but I think mentally, it's definitely put me in the right place to go into that next career, whatever that be. Because so you all know that rugby players, you earn well, but you don't earn enough to not work again. Um, so it's about planning for that. And I, when I left Queens, I didn't think I'd be at that stage for a long time. Whereas I think having that kind of mental break, going something completely new, um, a new way of life, living in new buildings, just it just puts you out of your comfort zone. And I think for me, I, I was in that, uh, especially like I said, I lived in the same place. Um, and it definitely makes you change a little bit, which has been great. Yeah, I'll just so you know, I found Broccoli Man, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> ready? You ready for Broccoli Man? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, he's strapped up. <laughs> mate, Seattle. Oh, Seattle, man. Yeah, yeah. To be honest, if I if I thought we only eat broccoli, I thought we'd be in better shape than that. <laughs> <laughs> As it is there, is that why he's been told he's broccoli, man? I, I I thought he was like I thought it was like folklore over there. I thought he was just a superstar, the broccoli man from Seattle, but obviously not. No one cares about him. I, I mean, it might be a lot. A lot of these, a lot of clubs do have random people. I know um, Austin. Yeah. Austin have quite an unusual guy in the stand who kind of gets, he's a basically MC or crowd, crowd hype man and stuff. And I think what I realised is, look, Americans, sport, a lot of their sport, I don't understand, especially the big ones. Um, but what Americans do amazingly well is off the field. Yeah. And a lot of them have this motto is, you're not in the sports industry, you're in the entertainment industry. If people like sport, they're going to come to your stadium. They're going to buy the shirts, they're going to do all that stuff. How do you get the families to come who don't know anything about rugby or baseball, whatever it be, and come week after week, buy the shirts, buy the merchandise, all that kind of stuff. And that's the whole entertainment package they do so brilliantly well. And actually, coming back to England this time, I actually think a lot of premiership clubs have done that. You look at the Friday night games and the light shows and fireworks and all that kind of stuff. And it's starting to come in. And I think that's brilliant. Because it just adds a little bit of magic. It adds, makes it more of a spectacle. Whereas over there, they do it every single game. Did you play against those boys, the LA Guiltinis? Yeah, unfortunately, that was the second time I did my shoulder. Yeah. And mate, thinking they're superstars, eh? A lot of my mates are there, but bloody hell. <laughs> were, they, were they the most... They're like, they were the Saris of that league, weren't they? Everyone hated them. Yeah, I, th- no, I think... Anyone who's successful, you, you don't seem to like, do you? Because you, there's always a little bit of jealousy of it. Yeah. It's always about what they're doing, what they're doing. And um, I think when results aren't going your way as well, because you know what it's like. You've all been at clubs where you feel you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, and then they're winning, they're doing the same. And then you see them on social media and they're all having beers or whatever else. or they're Turning up to train and they're budgie smugglers. And they're budgie smugglers. Yeah. And you're <laughs> I, I, I remember, who was it? Sarries. It was, it was when Sarries used to do a lot of their trips. Um, yeah. And it was always when they played Wasps. And they would obviously be, be on the piss away for, I think they went to like St. Anton or wherever they went, Miami or whatever, for, for four days. And Joe Lawrence, who was captain of Wasp at the time, he said they would always come back. And obviously the team talked every week. They've been in the piss all week. They've done this. And he said they would always lose. Yeah. He said they would always lose to them. And they were like, oh, these guys have been out in a jolly. Um, and I think when you do get that kind of, that culture, that environment, that winning mentality, uh, moment, momentum's a huge thing in sport, isn't it? And when it's on your side, it's a good thing. And when you're trying to get it back, it can be tough. Max, obviously, you know, a scrappy 13-5 loss. You actually seem to be playing better rugby, but couldn't quite get the points. What's what was going wrong in the northeast for the Bears? Oh man, yeah, it was just we left a lot of opportunities on the table. Pretty cliche in it, but um, 
we're going to persevere soon. I can feel it coming together, Mark. It's coming. Oh, yeah. it's coming. But right now, it's like what, what Chris says about momentum. It's, a, it's an elusive beast when you're trying to get it back. But when it's there, you're like, this is effortless. This is wonderful. And then, um, yeah, but right now we're, um, we're soul searching and we're going to find a way. But Pat's been pretty positive. Um, he sort of just, um, just like trying to keep us galvanized, keep us, keep us chilled. Not, not, not too much blue language. No one's getting um, fried just yet, but it could get weird next week. As we're on the bye week right now, so that Monday, Monday morning week next week could be, could be weird. Could be weird. Targets on backs in that um, review meeting, but we'll see. Oh, who, sorry, who have you got this weekend? You haven't got a game. No, bye week. I'm just, I've just been um, chilling. What, yeah. What's um, what's Pat Lamb's kind of mentality? Obviously, we've always we've had those massive losses and whatever, or couple, and you dread going in for a Monday morning, that Sunday night, and you know you've messed up or something. What's he like? Is he a shouter? Is he kind of a one-on-one review man? Is he kind of we're all watching the whole video, we're all doing it. <laughs> yeah. So. He'll do the whole, he'll expect like the one-on-ones. So especially if you've had a big boo-boo in the game, he's expecting some kind of explanation. He wants some accountability there. And then, but the, he's a big um, review guy. So our meetings are very thorough, very long. Oh, I've, and he goes I've through heard. the whole game. Oof. Yeah. And there is some, there's some, there's some calling out, but he's pretty respectful um, mm. and he understands. But um, no, when he, when he loses it, actually, it's more, it's hard to predict, to be honest. But most of the time, he's he's fairly tempered. Yeah. Uh, see that watching the whole game for me, mate. You got to change it up, Max. Go in there, tell him. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you met Pat, F- man? F- hey, Pat. Scrap your reviews, yeah. mate. Let's just go on the piss this week. Go on a big bender this week. No game. Fucking get some connections back as men, and we'll go out and win next week. Who you got next week? Irish. Oh, piece of piss. Absolute piece of piss. You're laughing. I don't want to jinx you, but you're laughing. You'll be all right. Here we go. We're fine. We're, hey, we're all sorted next week. But that's what I mean. Go on the piss, like Sarries. So then yeah. when you beat London Irish, which you're going to do anyway, you can go, it's because we went on the piss midweek. Uh, well, Ryan, no crisis meeting for you. I see your Glasgow team making it three on the bounce. 17-6 victory away well, uh, well, at uh, Zebra. How, did you, was how was the excursion down to Parma? It wasn't as easy as it sounds. We we should have done a lot better. We we ran away with it in the first half, and then one of those second halves, the game was just we were shocking, absolutely shocking. But mate, it was roasted, twenty degrees. It wasn't that hot, but it was hot. It was very hot, and uh, boys were bowing. But hey, I went over there. Honestly, it's one of those ones. I mean, we've we've played Zebra eighteen times, and we've never lost. And again, Robbo, as I was captain this week, as one of them things you like. I don't bring up that we beat them. So it, don't bring up that it's 17 and 0 because that's bad luck. And all week you're trying to like, we go over there and we win. We don't, you know, we've never lost. You never say that. Never say we've never lost. We're going to go over there and win like we do. And so it was just that one was in my mind the whole time. And a couple of the boys, the new guys especially, were like, I told them after, I was like, you know, we've never lost over here, 18 and 0. And they're like, oh my God. <laughs> Thank God you didn't tell us before. Uh, quick one on the. Uh, massive Tong and winger you've just signed, uh, Ryan Walter Fafita. Uh, it's actually a side one for who's the play- the one player you hated doing contact training against. The kind of scariest player that you have to come up against every <laughs> single day. These boys will tell you, it ain't about the scary boys. It's not about the the scary wingers. It's about the misfits, the blokes that are dyspraxic, that can't control their own feet and their own elbows in malls and stuff, like. Toe treader on us. Yeah, Chrissy Halafia was he was horrible. There I mean, <laughs> and, and he was in Queens when I was there. And to be fair, in training, he would never touch yeah, anyone. He was fine. He would be like yeah. he'd be like this. But in games, honestly, he uh, he he killed people like properly. Um, yeah. With another guy he, called Mo Vasafalu. Don't know if you remember him. Yes. He's yeah. Played Samoan for um, guy. GB as well. Yeah, like rugby yeah. league. Played for Wigan, like proper yeah, like class rugby league player. Ball. One of the biggest talking points of the weekend, Saracens annihilating Bath. Bath conceding 71 points at home. A biggest defeat in their history. Third most points conceded in Prem history, uh, leading to their fourth consecutive loss for the first time in 20 years. Uh, is there any future for Stuart Hooper? Hey, I'm not, I'm not getting him, Zach. I mean, I think he's got to do a lot to sort it out. I think he needs to get the players back on track. And 
I mean, they go to Quinns this weekend, which, I mean, we know oh, what Quinns are like at the moment. It's, it's fun when you're under pressure, but not the place you want to go. And I always think this with coaches and stuff. Look, at the end of the day, they've got to put a, a thing in place, but the players have got to go out there and stand up. And the fair, fair play to Saris. I think they, they, they turned it on, didn't they, this weekend. And I think people were wondering when they were going to click. They were, they were getting results, but they weren't. And then this weekend was... Uh, and like we spoke about earlier, I'm sure that Monday morning was was quite tough for all those bar players, unfortunately. Because look, as much as it was on on Stuart, it, it's on all of them as an organisation. And you can't be pointing the finger and saying it's him and he's got to go. As players now, more than ever, you have to stand up. And there, there was a thing we used to speak about: is is don't have corridor kind of creeps and corridor conversations, because that that's when things get get out of hand. Let's. I know we, we've joked about kind of those meetings, but if the, if there's stuff going wrong there, then they've they've got to kind of stand up and address it together. I think. They need a circle of trust. They, they need, need it one, now. Yeah. Get in circle of trust. They've had a circle of trust, I reckon. But yeah, that's um. Oh, imagine coming in on a Monday morning after that. That would be difficult to take. You're uh, yeah, you're panicking all weekend, waiting to come back in. But they just look like they give up. You know, I mean, what was it? Four, it was forty five nil at half time. So you see them come out and I think they skipped, they scored, didn't they, after half time? They came out and did all yeah. right and actually scored a try. And it, I don't know what his name is, but you can't be celebrating to the, to the crowd when you're 45 nil down, you score a try. But one of them did. <laughs> oh, mate, don't do that. But get back and just go, right, here we go again. But then they don't, they lose it. And then you lose momentum of the game and you're just under the pump. And to, like, as, as Chris said, like, fair play to Saris. Like, they were so smart. Just little things like which Bath were switching off to like that little quick tap they took and they looked like they were going to yeah. do that when the hooker smashes up and they just do that little hands down the side simple little things like that where you could say yeah okay it's Bath switching off but Saris are pretty smart around those little things as well so they look bloody sharp and there's a few boys out to prove a point to Eddie Jones with the squad you know that he selected and um, probably put their hand up again as well. Yeah. Max, you played you played against them recently, obviously, and you played there as well. You know, what do you think is leading to this kind of run of form? Oh, hard to say, man. Like, I thought when they came down to us, they played some really good rugby. But I mean, maybe we're struggling to perform as well, I suppose. But um, it's a weird one, isn't it? Because on the the team sheets, unbelievable. Like that Bath team is very strong. A lot of like up and coming England guys. Um, but yeah, it looks as if um, Stu may have lost the players. I suppose I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. But do you do you do you get rid of Stu Hooper now at this point in the season, looking for someone else? Like that could just make it. I don't know. That could make it worse. But I suppose it worked very well for Quinns in regards to Paul Gustard. Maybe. Maybe I don't. But yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. That's a hard a hard place to be in. Absolutely, it's, there'll be like a lot of soul searching and, as you said, some transparent dialogue. Oh, uh, Chris, man. have you been in those situations where there's that, where you feel that, as Max just mentioned, a, a coach has lost their players? Then what, what, what tends to be the process? What actually happens? You know, you're talking about the corridor chat. Is that the, the first sign that something's going wrong? Yeah, look, there's, there's always going to be people who are unhappy, whether it's guys who aren't playing and feel they should be. Um, and it, it's trying to cut through the crap and actually saying, okay, why, why are we not performing? Firstly, I think you've always got to look at, look at yourself. Why are you not doing enough? Uh, why are you not producing it? Is it a motivational thing? Is it a preparation thing in the week? Like I said, Saracens are a very well drilled team. They're very smart. They've got good players, but they've got good coaches set up. So when, we, when you look at Bath, like what's, what's not quite working? Yeah, look, I've, I've been in those environments where unfortunately, like we, we've, we've joked about there, some very tough conversations can be made and have to be made sometimes. And you know, Quinn's, Quinn's made one last year, didn't they? Um, I got on extremely well with Paul Gussard. He was my my coach with England. He was kind of my go-to back row guy who would always kind of liaise with defensively in particular. Kane's Quinn's got, got on well with. Um, and, and for whatever reason, things got a bit worse last year. Then all of a sudden they, they went and lost eight games out of 10. Eight games out of ten, unfortunately, there were some tough decisions. Maybe some conversations happened, uh, and then they go on to win eight games out of ten. Yeah. 
So, so sometimes, and they manage to keep it going. A lot of times, I think when there's an immediate change, it, there's always an improvement, no matter what club, what country, there's always an instant improvement. Um, but it's then how do you sustain that? Um, and then you need good people in place for that. Now, I don't know. I don't know the way they play their rugby or, um, you know, what their coach is doing. But a lot of the time you can see that if it's a coach trying to push a style of rugby on a team, that fails. Like, we're all about now and, you know, the way we are with rugby clubs now is the players lead everything. They're the ones that are on the field. Like you talk about these leadership groups and stuff like that. It, you know, a lot of the time here as well, a coach comes to us and be like, right, what do you boys think? You know, how do, we, how do you want to play? And if the players are happy with how they're playing and it's actually the ideas are coming from the players, then it works. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to have it both ways. So there could be something there. But, um, yeah, tough old time for them. Hopefully they turn it around again. I'm not sure who they've got this weekend. Or have they got a bye weekend as well? You know? They're Quins. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, we said that. Jesus. Thing is, yeah. I've also think, like, I think Bath have sort of adopted with the new coach Dave Williams coming, I think they've adopted a more attacking mindset and it's taken, it will take some time to sort of implement that. And when you come up against the best D in European rugby ever, these things can look worse than they are as well. But we'll see what happens. Yeah. You, you, um, you've got a lot of mates there, eh, Max? Are they saying it's a tough old place to be at the moment? Are they, I haven't you really speak to many of the boys that. from there? I haven't spoken to them since this game. But they seem like when I saw them last weekend, they seemed um, they seemed very um, jubilant. But um, I haven't spoken to them since this week. Yeah. I, I always think Bath must be a tough place to live when results don't go your way. Small, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a small city. Everyone knows rugby. I imagine the players walk down the high street, and it's it's a bit of a bad place. I mean, you yeah. you must have felt it. No, a bit yeah. more. It's an incestuous place because it's just so <laughs> tight. Like, it's just so small, and like everyone's always talking about the glory days. Um, and it's just not quite happening. And they can see that there's these the calibre of players they've got that represent the team. It's just dumb. Yeah, they're a fickle bunch at times, but aren't all fans. So the boys, a lot of the boys live in Bath then. Do they, or do a lot of them live outside like and just travel in? Because it is tiny, isn't it? It's a small little city. Um, Most of them live like in there? Outside, yeah. There's like a few villages outside of Bath as well. But like Bath, Bath city centre is small, but itself, it's like a population of 85,000 or so. But there's a few guys who live um, around it, like Trowbridge, um, Bradford. Like there's, um, there's other little spots, yeah. Uh, right, let's move on to uh, some international rugby, of course, that's coming up. The England squad emissions, none in September's big name. Uh, emissions have been included in the squad. George Ford, Jamie George, Mako, Billy Vinopola, all been left out. Um, particularly, I think, with um, Jamie George and, and Ford, George Ford, they've been in the form of their lives in the Prem. Are we surprised to see these guys being left out? Well, Jamie's been called back in today because of Luke Cowan Dickey's injury. Yeah, but but the, he, was, he, he was one who, again, I thought should have probably been in, involved in. I think probably Luke maybe maybe took that starting role. Um, I, I was surprised with Mako. For me, Mako and, and Max will know more kind of specialist stuff about the front row. But he, he's world class. And whenever Joe, Ellis, Gens and, and Mako have been fit, they've all, all three have always been in camp. Or, of course, only two have been playing. But they've always had kind of all three and whether it's kind of pushing each other. So I thought that was a little bit of a strange one. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big big fan of Marcus Smith. I, th I think it's it's time for him to be tested against the best, rather than just America or Canada or Tonga or or someone like that. It's time for him to to challenge and be challenged by the best teams in the world. And I think for me, he's he's answered all the questions which have been asked of him. He's he's done his time. He's he's been patient. And um, I think at the age of 22, is he? Is he better than where a lot of players were in that kind of international birth? Very possibly. And, and speaking to him about kind of his experience with the Lions, he's like, look, for the last, whatever it was, five weeks, he got to train with the best in the business, Finn Russell, Bigger, Farrell, um, and learn from him. He's a sponge. He wants the information. He wants to be better. He's always pushing himself. Um, and from what, I mean, he's only played one game so far this year, but he looks like he's hit the ground running again. You've obviously seen him up close for, for years. 
from your perspective, is this just you're not surprised remotely uh, of of where he is now, and where do you think he's going to go on to? No, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, this, this is a kid who was, or got a man now, who was training with England when he was doing his A levels at Brighton College. It, it's not been a flashing pan. I remember he, like, we were like, who's this guy? I knew he was in the Quint Academy, but I didn't really know too much about him. Came to train in between his exams. And I think it was one of the second rounds. I can't remember who it was. Got up and smashed him, and it was, it was probably a bit uncalled for. Um, he, he got up, shrugged his shoulders. Next time he got the ball, picked the ball up, ran around that second row. But yeah, I mean, look, he's a guy who's got a huge... The biggest with him is exciting. He, he's not the biggest lad. He makes his tackles. He's a brave kid. Uh, and like I said, he's, he's not afraid to try things. And I think he's... And at the age of 22, I, can't, I don't know how many games he would have played already, but he's been playing straight out of school. He must play 95% of the game straight out of school. Um, so look, he's had some good times, some tough times, where he's had to learn. And he's had to reflect. And he's had to be patient, waiting for... This opportunity, and you look at Ford and Farrell, these guys I think were playing for England when they were in about 19, maybe. I don't know, I don't know about Finn Russell's type of age, so he's a little bit older and probably um, than that. But I think you put him with the experience of a Ben Youngs in front of him and a, a Farrell next to him, and he's got that confidence and he's got that kind of that maturity around him as well. I think I worry that putting with Farrell though and Farrell. Dominate. Almost dominates him. No, don't do that. No, you're not allowed to do that. Is he that type of guy, Farrell, to be like? Because I've heard what he's like on the training field, but in a game, is he going to go, mate? Do what you need to do, or is he going to go, no, no, give us, give us ball and go kick? <laughs> no, <laughs> look, terrible. Think, look, look, for me, Farrell is probably the best player I've ever played with in terms oh, yeah? of what he delivers and what he can do, and his mentality, the mental side of him, um, and how how driven he is. But I think with that, I think you have to respect the players around you. And the 10 generally runs the show, doesn't it, in attack? And I think for anything, you've got to trust that. And I think a lot will depend on how Eddie and England want to play the game. Are they going to say, OK, you've got, you've got faith, we're going to go for it. Or are we going to be like a lot of international rugby is at the moment? Yeah. A bit more pragmatic. Are we going to play not very much in our half? Because for England, you look back to the Six Nations, the autumn before that, there's opportunities out there, but they haven't quite taken it. Because again, are they a bit, a bit contained in themselves? So I think now, I mean, like I said, to leave a lot of international or experienced players out, uh, Radwan, the, the Newcastle winger, I think it is. I mean, I hope he gets around because yeah. seeing what he can do as well. And I think, look, I don't think there's going to be massive changes, but I think there'll be a, a couple scattered around. Um, and it was great to see that freshness come in. I think Don Grant will play at eight. Yeah. Uh, Simmons on the bench. I think a, a back row of, of Underhill, Don Grant and Curry will be pretty formidable. And Simmons kind of coming on. Um, but yeah, I think there's a huge amount of excitement there. So Luke Keown Dickey's now out. They're pulling yeah. Jamie George in. Yeah. Jamie George obviously wasn't ahead of Nick Dolly. Is Nick Dolly going to start? Because he's been outstanding for Leicester. You were talking about him a couple of weeks ago, Max, saying... Hey, like he's come out of nowhere. He's absolutely tearing it up. I mean, who else is in there? Is it, it Jamie maybe Brown he's... from Newcastle? But I'd, I'd expect, yeah, I'd expect they put Jamie George in there just experience wise. So you think they'll go straight in? I reckon get that Nick Dolly in. Let him start. Let him start. Chuck Jamie George on the bench if they're going for it. They got Tonga first up. They'll be all right. Yeah, but, but that's the thing. Yeah, like with Tonga, are they going to try a couple more guys? And they probably would, potentially, I think. But then also you need to get in a bit of rhythm, don't you, for when the big boys come in the week after. Yeah. But I think, yeah, I think he'll be elevated to start straight away. Unless, Nick Dolly, unless he makes a huge impact in that first kind of training camp, um, I think Jamie will be in there. Because then again, at nine, you've got a lot of contrast. So you look at Ben, you speak of Ben Youngs, but then they've got that Raffy Quirk coming in. Like He's a completely different player to Ben Youngs. So you have someone like that on the bench. Spoke about it a lot with the Lions stuff. You know, having that different style of play so you can bring players on to open up a game. It'll be interesting to see what they do there and yeah, what they try against Tonga. With Chris, with you know, you've seen at first, you know, first hand Eddie Jones being ruthless with Cullings before. The fact that Jamie George is now being pulled back in, like how much is mind games and how much is it him actually perhaps even putting an end to people's international careers? Yeah, look. No. Look, unfortunately, I've been cold by him. Um, and it's never a nice thing to be, unfortunately. Um, 
And I, I honestly thought with a lot of them, it was going to be a, a kick up the arse until probably this announcement and then bringing a lot of them back in. Um, and when we, we've seen, look, he wants to, and look, this is the time to try things. The autumn campaign, they've got two years. There's probably not as much pressure as there is on the Six Nations campaign where um, more rivalry, all that kind of stuff. Um, and no, I, it's a strange one because if Eddie doesn't pick them, he gets moaned out for not picking them. If he drops senior guys for them, he gets moaned <laughs> out for dropping senior guys. True. So as a, as, a, as a coach, you can't win. But I think w- whatever it is, and as a coach, as a, as a captain, you have to be confident because when a decision's made, if, if it doesn't work, it's on you. And no matter what, what players are in and out and all that kind of stuff. So you go back to what you know and what you can trust. Um, but I think, look, I think, he's, I think he's been brave and I think he'll be brave in this campaign to, to try things. And look, Eddie's, Eddie's the same man. If he thinks someone's good enough to play international rugby, they will. And he'll test guys, uh, more the younger guys, he'll probably test them, see what they're about. And I know Max knows Carl Sinclair quite well. Where he, was, he was tested quite a lot early on by Eddie. Um, and you come through and look at the player he's now and he wants guys to be ready for international rugby but not just be ready but to excel at international rugby and be there for years um, so no, I'm excited by this awesome campaign and the squad he's picked How does he test exactly? I mean everyone's a little bit different um, you look at someone like Johnny May and Johnny May who is now in England's leadership group and one of the key leaders in the England squad but when Eddie kind of first came on, he would test him and basically see where he's at mentally. I think because the mental side of the game is, is so big now. Um, but for me, his man management is brilliant. He treats everyone differently. Like someone like myself, he would always just be quite honest. If I play badly, he'll tell me I'll be bad. If I needed to work on something, he'll tell me. There's other guys, like a James Haskell, who, life and soul of the party, likes to give a bit of stick. He would just banter with them all day take the mick out of each other and that's what we get the best out of that. Other players who give responsibility to, to encourage them to come out of shells and really kind of embrace the game. Um, so there's not one hard and, raw, hard and fast rule for everyone. He treats everyone differently, which I think is great. A lot of speculation about England's strongest back row. How do you see it? Yeah. I think it's that, what we said, Curry, Underhill and Dombrant at the moment. Simmons coming off the bench. I think that's he... I think if Jack Willis is back, all of a sudden it's. Different. I, I don't know. Who, I don't know who you're dropping out of that lot, to be honest. Are you uh, putting? Are you putting uh, Courtney Laws in the in the row then? Yeah. So my pack would be, Marla. It would have been Karen Dickey, but now we've got Jamie George and Sink, Courtney, Marrow. Um, yeah, Underhill, Curry, and Don Brand. We were going that, and then I'd probably go Youngs. Marcus, Farrell, Manu, Anthony Watson, uh, Radwan, and Max Malians. I like him. Like Max yeah. Malians looks a he looks a good player. I think he just looks. He's one of those players that look, similar to Alex Skew kind of thing. He just looks yeah. like he has time. He's skillful. He, he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Uh, you know, real elegant player. I think for me, Tom is brilliant. Tom is such a good player from. I, I was I was in there when he when he first came into camp and went to Argentina and seeing him and his brother for the first time. Tough guy, and he's matured. He he's a guy who's he's a great character and he's a guy you want to have in the squad because he's good fun off the field. Um, but as a player, he's gone up against the world's best now and handled handled himself. And I think that's the thing I remember in one of our first camps that it was actually a camp he broke his arm I think and we were mauling things led over. And I think one of the guys, I think it's Marla, went at him and he didn't back down. And I just thought, you know what, this guy, he's tough. And, and that's what you want from your back row, someone who's going to stand up no matter who you are, whether if you're an experienced player or what. And, and I'm glad someone like that is starting to find his voice. He's showing leadership. If he thinks stuff wasn't good enough, fair enough, he's coming out his head. And I think that's, that's an important thing. We want, not only do we want good players, we want strong leaders in England. We want people who are good team men. Um, and good characters to have around because he's definitely a good character to have in amongst the squad. But in terms of what, what happened on the Lions, I, I don't know. It, wasn't, it probably wasn't the most exciting series to watch as we could probably all, all jack talk, but that comes from both sides, doesn't it? Um, so, Can yeah. I just say, I've sat here and watched Chris do a whole podcast for an hour and 10 minutes with a baby 
Mate, I'm in the shit next week because if my missus finds out and she reckons I can do this with the kids, I don't know how you've, I don't know, I don't know how you've done it, mate. The week man's been brilliant. If my missus yeah. finds out that you did this with a baby, she's going to be, right, you can look after the kids now during this. This is my two hours off, mate. Yeah, I've just you've got, you've got to time it, mate. You've got to time it. I'm, we're learning. Bloody <laughs> hell. I'm going to be right up this shit. I've got scratch marks outside the door from mine. I can just hear them. But um, <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's quickly go through... I mean, if, unless they are vastly different. But Max, can we get your your starting fifteen for uh, your England starting fifteen? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much the same. You, uh, I think uh, Ellis and Marler are sort of interchangeable, but you don't lose much. And then uh, I kind of like, I'd love to get Mark Axon in there. That'd be funky, but it's hard to. Uh, what? Yeah, shout out to him. What is he? Thirty-one. Yeah, he's 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 a late bloomer, but he's always been classy. Just gone under the radar. But um, he'd be cool. Yeah. But it's hard to, re- you can't really drop Farrell and Manu's Manu. It's tough. But yeah, I'm pretty much the same as Chris. Same team, yeah. Isn't that weird though? You mentioned Mark Atkinson and um, Lewis Rezamit talked about him as the, who he thought is the most underrated player out there. Uh, isn't it kind of crazy that there's so much rugby and we watch so much rugby and yet somebody can fly so much under the radar and then and then bloom in their early 30s i think it's it, more, it says more about sort of the guys that england have had do you know what i mean like it's hard to get around who's been there they've just been such integral parts of the team like if man who's fit he has to be in there we you can't like you can't over you can't overstate how good he's been for england he's a, a complete freak show and then owen farrell sort of synonymous with the rose like he's the face of English rugby in so many ways. And then if you're trying to get guys in around him, like George Ford, who's been serving at 10 admirably, you have to have them on the field. So, But Mark Atkinson is such a different kind of player because he's, um, he's sort of a big man with like really deft skills. And that's, that's what makes him quite special because he, he, can, he can smash it up on the gain line. And then he's got these wonderful deft touches. He just does naughty things with the ball in hand. I love players like that. There's yeah. there's always players like that at a club that, you know, like not many of the fans really see what they're worth, but it's the boys in the club know, oh, right, as long as he's on the field this week, we'll be all good. And there's that player that goes under the radar, does his work, does his graft on and off the field that, yeah, the outside world don't look in as much and go, oh, yeah, he's an unbelievable player. But you need those guys in a rugby team. And that's the, the feeling you get from him. And he, he's one of those club men that you're like, yeah, he's he's finally deserves a shot now. So it'd be cool to get someone like that in there, eh? But as you said, I don't see him getting in with Manu. So. Is Manu going get, to get through without getting injured? No, it's, that's, the, that's the big one, isn't it? That is the big question. But I think it also gives every player hope, though, doesn't it? That you don't <laughs> really have to be it's in. Not over yet, lads. I'm still in. Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, you don't have to be there at 22 or 23 to play for your country. Like, yeah. Everyone develops at different stages, or, or even those players who, who don't get rugby clubs or academy contracts straight away. Some go to university and kind of come through and excel and, and all that kind of stuff. We all have a different path, don't we? It's just yeah. hoping someone likes what you can offer. Um, right, quickly, get, let's get yours. I, I need your, uh, your who 15 ca- as well, Who please. cares about mine? I don't care if England lose, do I? Mate, so I've been told cares? to do it. Oh, no, Come no, on. No. Okay, I'm Maybe going exactly the same as the boys. I've pretty much said the same. But guess what? I didn't put Farrell in there. <laughs> yeah. Just to annoy him. He's never going to find out, but... I'm sure he'll um, listen. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I didn't have him in there. But do you know why it is? It's more to the point of what I said. I, I've had Marcus Smith in there. Um, and I'd want Mark Swift to be able to do what he'd want to do. And I just feel like he would feel maybe, you know, Farrell would be overbearing on him and be like, you can't do this, you can't do that. Quick predictions from you, Chris, for the uh, for, for England's Autumn Internationals. 3-0. Solid. Max? 2-1. Where's the loss? Tonga. <laughs> Tonga. Um, I'm going to go with Australia. Uh, yeah, I think they'll lose to Australia. I think they'll beat Tonga, lose to Australia and scrape it through against South Africa. So, talking of Australia, uh, your ex-teammate Max uh, and Chris, Sam Burgess, just won SAS Australia recently. Uh, was he one of the hardest teammates you played with? Yes. 
Yeah, he was. He was a tough guy. He was a tough dude, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was, he must be tough. Both of you just like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he liked it attritional. Like he's the sort of bloke who moisturises with crushed glass. Like he was weird. Yeah. <laughs> Hell of a boy. Yeah. Uh, Max, you famously, uh, Sam rather famously fell out with um, the forwards big time. How uncomfortable was that to witness firsthand? And what was the inside story on that for that? Oh, what uh, with Fordy? Uh, um... <sighs> I don't really know the complete ins and outs of it, but essentially I think um, Mike wanted him there for a long time, like longer than he was there for. And um, I think the stark reality of playing for England under so much expectation of being the chosen one in rugby league and not quite delivering, but I still thought he went well, given how long he'd been in the game of union. And then obviously uh, after that, Sam sort of had other ideas. I think he missed being the king of South Sydney, which is, <laughs> if you've ever been there, it's not hard to imagine why when oh, you hear that. To yeah. off. I think he wanted, he was homesick, wanted to get back to his family. And I think Mike felt kind of betrayed by that. Um, and that's sort of how it, how it went down off, off the back of sort of a tough season after that, making the final. And we then what happened? A, and then it all went Pete Tong or being lawyers, et cetera. Et cetera. I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know enough about it. That's, that's how I sort of see, see the sort of story going. Yeah. Make, make something up. Tell us a story. Yeah. <laughs> the old, old semi Madrada, no comment, Max. Come on. Yeah, exactly. No, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being a diplomat. That's actually sort of what happened. He sort of got his way out of the contract somehow. And then he was back home. And then he, would, he got back to um, the bunnies. He just woke up one morning and he was gone. Yeah, pretty much. I remember we were doing like the, I forgot what it was. It was like, it was like the mixed veg, like maggot, maggot Brian. He was also rehabbing, coming back. He was there for the beginning of it. And then the next day, that was it. See you later. Back on Russell Crowe's yacht. Yeah, back with Rusty. Back with old, um, are you not entertained, Crowe? <laughs> well, Chris, what, of all the players you had to captain, what made Sam Burgess perhaps a bit more difficult to manage. He's spoken about feeling separate from the rest of the squad uh, and management during the 2015 World Cup. Yeah, look, this was, this was six, six years ago now. Uh, well, I don't think Sam was difficult to manage. I think he was a, he was a great team man. Uh, I'm sure Max will say the same. He was a great team man. He got involved. He was a good character around the place. Just, yeah, for whatever reason, there were, there were things he didn't enjoy or, or whatever and, and decided to go back. But as a as a guy and as a player to play alongside, he was, he was a good guy. And he always trained hard. He always contributed, like we said, about adding things. He would always add ideas and contribute stuff. Um, so no, he, he wasn't a, a tough guy to manage at all. Fair enough. But hard as nails. Yeah, it was tough. He was tough. Um, I mean, you look at that final we played in, didn't he break his face or something and then play the rest of the game? Or, Floating. Um, uh, I remember actually we played against it was against Scotland, actually. And I'm sure a lot of guys have had broken noses and all that kind of stuff. And when you break your nose, it's horrible. But you don't want to say, because it sounds, people always think it's a bit pathetic, but it, it kills. Like, literally, you tap it and it kills. Um, and Johnny May broke his nose in the first game, and then we went up to Scotland the week after. And he comes up to me and goes, can you tell the ref to tell the Scottish players to stop hitting me on the nose? Because every rock there would apparently just go like this on his nose. Uh, but yeah, that's that's Johnny. Uh, he's oh. out himself. Yeah, nothing it's, worse. It's, the eyes, the eyes go start watering as well. I'm not crying. <laughs> I'm fine. I mean, do you guys think it's uh, league or union is is actually tougher? I mean, having got having talking about Sam Burgess's just hardness. I think I mean, I've never played league. I wouldn't know. Um, people who have come across say the fitness in league is tougher. It's really. Defensively, they say the fitness in league is, is hard. Mate, have you seen them? They're just like, they just all walk around. Like, they make it, everyone's just walking around. I'm like, this looks easy. And that's attack. Oh, yeah, still, both sides of the ball, I swear. <laughs> I'm just watching it. And like, kick chase, mate, they would get done on their kick chase. What are you doing? You're not working hard enough. Escorts, where are your escorts? Why are you not ushering? Come on. <laughs> I'm watching it going, that looks like an absolute piece of piss. <laughs> it's a 10 meter shuttles, bro, on D. Yeah, and then- quad burners. And the geezers have got 10-metre run-ups as well. 
So that's well, that's where your shoulder will come in very <laughs> old trout shoulders over there. You have to be oh throwing, my. straight under the bus. These that's, slopes. Yeah, that's where it gets weird. I think that's the and obviously, obviously there's no like real set piece. So it's all really about just the carry, like ferocity in it, like stopping momentum. Who so do you reckon would be good in there? What union player do you reckon would? Oh, um, I think uh, Sammy Underhill would go very well. But maybe he's too much of a leg chopper. Yeah, you, you have to. Yeah, you need to. Be, you need to be a. You need to be one of those bear hugging dudes. Um, yeah, he'll choke tackle. Obviously, obviously, Sammy would be a savage, but he was a Paramount like great. So we know that. Um, who else would be a freak show? Out of the England boys, uh, I think Manu would go insanely well if he could stay fit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alex Gens, I reckon. Genji. Oh yeah, Genji would be class. Like a decent prop forward. Yeah, he'd be great. Yeah. Be you know the worst good. the worst looking bit of it is when you know when they're attacking and they lie on top of you and you've got to try and get up. You know when those we get those yeah, drills like like, oh, mate, that looks tiring. That looks tiring. Just you gotta show the best you're working. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me get up. That looks horrible, that bit. Um mate, I I reckon I'll smash it at league. <laughs> I reckon you'd do right actually. Yeah, I think I'm, I reckon I might transition yeah. over. Big old haggard when, carcass out there. You'd, you'd <laughs> when, when the time runs out, you'll see me down at Wigan, mate. Yeah. Absolutely knocking me pan in. I love it. There was a lot of incredible rugby to enjoy this weekend in the Premiership and the Championship, of course. So we'll leave it down to Max to summarise the best of the action in his own unique way. Are you ready, Chris? Absolutely, gentlemen. Here we go. In this week's wrap up, we venture first to the autumnal tune where the Bears were thwarted by the Falcons in a scrappy contest. It was tenacious stuff. Perseverance will be ours. Whilst the Tigers stalked and maimed the Warriors, their march of retribution continues. Sail Sharks managed to resist the irresistible Quins and disheveled the crown of the champions down at the AJ Bell. X the Chiefs make it three on the bounce at the Rico. The boys are back in town. Not without controversy as a water boy yet again, this time of the wasp variety, sparks a melee of handbaggery. Very naughty. Whilst the wasp CEO addresses the Chiefs fans to cease their cultural appropriating headdress wearing ways. My, my. We venture west to Bath where the bloodthirsty legion of Saracens came, saw, and got weird at the wreck after a 1771 victory over the men of blue, black, and white. What next for the men of Bath? London Irish remaining winless, but robustly competitive with another draw against the men of Gloucester. Now we head to Italy where Ryan and the Glaswegian warriors went to Parma and bested the dreaded Zebre. Lord Eddie Jones has named his squad to don the rose, glaring a mission's eye the eye. Is this the end of the glittering international careers for the trio of Saracens and George Ford, or merely more mind games? Finally, we got to welcome back our guest, the Harlequins, England captain and San Diego legionnaire, Chris Robshaw. Yeah, oh, lovely. lovely. <laughs> My favourite so far. My favourite so far. <laughs> the best one so far, cool. Uh, well, sadly, that's all the time we've got left. Thanks for watching and listening. As always, do make sure you like and subscribe. Thank you to Ryan. Thank you to Max and thank you to Chris and we'll see you all next week.